Hey there everyone, John here. I hope you're all doing well. And welcome to the next episode of War for Read. I've got some really good books here for you this time. And I'm sorry that it's been a while since my last upload of this series. It's not worked out the way I've planned. But never mind all of that. I've got a great selection here that I'm sure a lot of people out there will be intrigued by though perhaps not as much as myself because all of these books today will be relating to Scottish history it's something that um, I've always tried to explore and discover my roots my ancestry How the state of affairs that I'm in today was formed, the development, how our ways with words or culture and ideas became the way that they were. So if you're Scottish or if you're someone that's very interested in the history of Scotland, and similar sorts of things, then I definitely think I've got some great books here for you. That out of the way. Let's go to the first one. And let's start with as far back as we can go. So I have this absolutely amazing book here. Europe. Between the Oceans by Barry Cunliffe. Now this book, uh, it doesn't deal exclusively with Scotland, but it does go very far back into the archaeological record of Scotland. It will also give you a great context into even beyond Scotland and how people migrated there uh, the earliest known sites from there and you'll be able to contrast that with what's the earliest known site overall in Europe and things like that so in giving you a full understanding it's definitely one to get this uh, it's a very massive book and it's printed on this magnificent paper that won't you, it won't um, degrade, it can't get mites in it or anything like that because it's all this uh, sort of very nice laminated paper and it comes with so many maps going into so much depth, so much detail, so much great pictures sourced uh, fantastically. I mean Barry Cunliffe himself is a professor in anthropology and he holds the chair of Cambridge University for anthropology as well. So you know of him that is a true expert that is devoted his whole life to trying to explain these things. And if you read this book, you basically have a uh, a huge, a huge amount of what you would pay thousands to learn at a university, you would have this here all backed up, sourced, referenced, everything like that. You have some great satellite photos and stuff like that as well. Now Barry Cunliffe also has a book. called Celts, which deals specifically with the Celtic peoples and has a much greater look at Scotland and Ireland. He also has a book um, called The Anglo-Saxon World, which is the same book but for the southern side. Uh, they are all fantastic. You can buy them. I think they're only recommended retail price at um, £20. And I think I got one of them for £12 at once. It's uh, outstanding value. 
for the amount of education that you can give yourself from one of these books. So Barry Cunliffe is a, he's an anthropologist, but I would say primarily he's more of the historian and uh, the archaeologist and sort of a more of the meta scientist, you know, he's one of these people who would be comparing fields of biology and geology together and things like that. He's not as much invested into the spiritual side of things or say religious and artistic. He knows the forms and how to differentiate pottery and such but he really talks in depth about what people really believed in culture which is a whole other side of anthropology now I have a great book for anyone here that is interested in the mythology of the Celtic people and appropriately titled the same by Charles Squire this was a great little book that I found in a charity shop, uh, like a lot of these are. And it really does give you a full picture into what was going around at that time. And if there are any gaps in what we know, it, it does inform you. Um, it is a little dated. This was first published in 1912, but I've never come across anything major um, in these writings that I then looked in other sources and you know it was different because whilst yes I'm sure that there has been some say on Cunliffe's side there's been more archaeological discoveries and there's uh, been new developments in what we know about people in a material sense Mostly Charles Squire sticks to sources that have been handed down uh, texts for centuries and then before that have been passed down allegedly through oral traditions and trying to create a sort of compendium in history of the Celtic peoples talking about um, the Tuatha de Danan and beings like that, the different stages and races. But he is quite um, eager to point out as well of how a lot of what we have today is being translated or transcribed down through the ages through um, Christian scholars or scribes. And so the stories have most likely been molded to fit other myth mythologies or specifically Christian lore so that it's reflective and it's not uh, heresy because one thing that's um, extremely unfortunate when you look into the history of Scotland and the Celts is their their culture was virtually completely destroyed they were slaved murdered en masse by the Romans people like the Druids faded in the legends reasons for why did the place these standing stones and what did they truly believe what did they truly practice who were they it's largely lost because of how much was destroyed and eradicated by conquest Scotland has gone through an extremely 
conflict based environment. It's a country of war and plight, of struggling, of fighting for freedom and doing things in spite of because it's a very dark place. It doesn't seem that it was always like that. But since it became contested, since it became invaded, it's had to adapt, it's had to change. And live on in whatever ways it can. But yeah, this um, book will also tell you about day-to-day -day folklore in Scotland and beings like fairies and elves and things like that. So it's a great read for anyone who's into mythology and folklore as a whole. For anyone else that's interested specifically in folklore and smaller stories of Scotland, this is a great collection. Obviously all these stories, they have no offer. They're all older than writing in Scotland. They've been around for thousands of years and they're so embedded into our consciousness that a lot of them even in Scotland we don't know we've never heard of them but the value and the sort of message behind it we know that so it goes to show like how much these stories had their place and it shaped the way people think and act or customs You get all sorts of great little stories in here and it's, you know, maybe you got kids or something like that or I like to read things like this myself, like when I'm going to sleep, just a nice little bite-sized 5-10 minutes and, you know, it's got like some nice symbolism and things to think about. This is um, published by Sanit. recommend this one too. It's a lot like Grimm's fairy tales and things like that. This is a great book that I have here. Highlanders, A History of the Highland Clans by Fitzroy McLean. I have to say this book is uh, very well made. I mean just about every page has brilliant fully coloured photographs or uh, paintings. You can see castles and things like this so when you read this book it's not like you're just reading text and um, trying to suck it in you get you get an outline of everything like all the basic facts around uh, events like it'll take you out through all the battles from about the 11th century AD um, taking you from roughly about the time of Robert the Bruce and the, the Battle of Bannockburn and it just uh, it takes you into all sorts of places it's not just about giving you a timeline it shows you like what what their life was like and, and what they did there uh, from dancing their social lives uh, you can see like different dresses here like the different types of tartans, the different types of pouches that they wore, um, what like, you know, portraits of lords, you see their castles, you see um, 
you get to know like well that's what someone that's the sort of trousers someone would wear in the highlands that's the sort of trousers someone would wear in the lowlands and little nuances like that so it's really it's really good it's, it's a perfect book to you know you could read it from front to cover it would be great or you can just open it up at random pages and find little things and it's, it's really good It's basically like having a museum or something in a book. Like the amount of content that you get in this is just something else really. And I'm always a fan of books that go that extra distance and it's not simply like writing things down. They've tried to make it right in the presentation and easier to absorb but more importantly, it's easier to appreciate because you're not just um, reading words, you're seeing it, you know? So yeah, that is a great book. Now I do have, um, I do have books like that. If you were wanting to get into the real knit and grit of all the politics of Scotland, all the sort of, um, well, this one is specifically about the Jacobite Rebellion. So they were fighting for the Stuarts to take back the throne after it had been usurped from them in a coup. And the English were effectively ruling Scotland. And so the Jacobites were predominantly Highlanders, Scottish Highlanders that uh, waged war. And there's a lot of guerrilla warfare that went on at this time as well. And covert operations, assassination attempts, um, making more treaties with the French and things like that fighting for a war that was seemingly lost and the English and the ruling monarchs at that time were they were essentially practicing ethnic cleansing they were banning things like tartan um, they were banning Scottish culture Highland culture and they wanted to dilute us they wanted to stop um, Scottish people from being what they were they wanted to make them more English and I guess uh, groomed to their liking this one's by Bruce Landman really does uh, give you everything that you want to know about that sort of time in terms of all the nuances and politics who side on who, all the names of car the names of uh, the kings and generals and agents and all that real detail, every place, the date, the time, all that stuff. Really great historical account. Another book that I have like this is by TC TC Smout. And he's more focused on social history. So whenever I'm reading T.C. Um, Smout, it's always more looking at the simple things in life. Um, what they ate for their dinners, how much money did they earn, and what was it like for the peasants? What was it like for just a normal person living back then? Uh, what was like getting married like and what was going to church like and what did the uh, what did people think and believe in just their day-to-day -day life uh, 
I have two of TC Smart Books here actually. And this one is dealing primarily over the Victorian era. It goes up to World War II as well, but the bulk of it is in the 19th century. This one goes uh, 300 years before then and up until that point as well. So you get like a very comprehensive like social history of Scotland in this uh, in these two books. And I have to say that um, it can, these, these books are really heartbreaking uh, for me to read, especially the one in the 19th century, but in this one too, <clears throat> the things that the Scottish government uh, did to its people, uh, the conditions that people lived in back then, the things that people did to get by in the way they were forced out of their homes for because economies were so rapidly changing and <clears throat> it's like I, I really didn't I knew Scotland was always a rough place you know what I mean it's it still is by and large but it's absolutely nowhere near to what it was like in say Glasgow or Edinburgh in the 19th century sometimes it, it's it, you have to stop reading and uh, you feel like you're going to be sick and you just it feels very weird for me that I have that uh, in my in my blood you know what I mean not even that far back like a hundred years ago 120 or 150 years ago and it wasn't uncommon for instance to be walking around the slums of Glasgow the infant mortality rate is so high there's no room at the cemeteries or no one can pay for a burial. So there's just dead babies lying on the top of tables in, the, in people's houses. They don't want to leave it on the ground for flies to, and bugs to get a hold of it. They've got it wrapped up on their dining table. So they eat on the floor instead. You know, people having no clothes, walking around with no shoes. Bertha gangsters and stuff like that, crime mobs, secretarianism between um, Protestants and Catholics, Irish immigrants coming in too because of the potato famine, populations booming and booming even though so many kids are dying and so many people are dying, the work conditions, it's just, I can't believe how... Uh, how brutal it was, you know. It's really dis it's really disturbing, honestly. Now I did have a book very similar uh, to the one by Bruce Landon and it dealt directly with the Reformation itself. Just let me see if I can have one more quick look. Doesn't seem like I can see it offhand again. Which is unfortunate. <clears throat> because I can't remember the author's name. But it was a very good book, also in a similar vein. It might actually be TC Smout or Bruce Lensman, but the title of it is something much alike. The Scottish Reformation in perspective, uh, you know, like 1500 to 1700 AD, and that gave you a really big insight into how Christianity had formed in Scotland, and how there was this growing divide between 
papacy and Protestant schools of thought. And this also made a greater rift between Scotland and Ireland, who were generally uh, quite close to each other. When you look at Celtic history and things like that, uh, the Irish are the Irish are very close to the Scots, and they've had a they've had a close relationship for a very long time. But when it came to this. Uh, between Catholicism and Protestant faiths, it created tensions, as it did within the countries themselves, across all of Europe. But it showed you how this rift changed, and perhaps one side dominated in one place and didn't in another, the political motivations for one way or another, and what was brewing in the country itself. Because one famous thing that I'm sure most people have heard of is how Scotland was particularly renowned for witch hunts. This is in the 17th century, in the 1600s, when King James VI of Scotland and King James I of England in the United Kingdom, there became a frenzy, panic, a satanic panic, if you like, where people were becoming increasingly petrified of what they perceive to be as an impending threat and attack from demons and witches from hell sorcerers that had been casting spells upon people doing Satan's work upon the world and when you study these things one thing I was surprised at was that it does actually seem that there were uh, perhaps even self-proclaimed witches and self-proclaimed Satanists and black ma magi back in those days in Scotland. Though it can be very hard to tell if it's true or not because the interrogation techniques that was used upon someone if they were suspected of witchcraft or allegedly caught in the act and were so brutal that it seems that there would be absolutely no way um, you wouldn't just become delirious and either say whatever they want you to say or on the other hand that people doing these things uh, ripping the fingernails and the skin off your fingers one by one and uh, putting nails in you and stuff like that um, people who do that sort of thing, they can't really be trusted uh, not to lie or make things up, so it can get quite can get quite confusing about what was really going on there, since a lot of it's really just what we've got passed down to us. So the Scottish witch trials in context here, and this is edited by Julian Goodair. But it's a, a, it's a collection of essays, um, mostly written by Scottish academics, I believe. Um, one of them was a lecturer for me, actually, at Edinburgh University. But it's filled with uh, lots of great stuff, lots of great info that goes very much in depth, that covers the whole period that um, this stuff was happening has pr precise statistics of specifically how many witches were burned, how many witches were hanged, and it has references to um, the court materials, which are in the public domain by the way, I might put a link down in the description for anyone who's interested, because I do know a website that has an archive of the trans 
court transcripts of when witches were burned in Scotland and things like that. It also talks about its connection to places like Salem or other witch burnings, why it was believed which um, there were more of them in Scotland and why we had specific or different methods for executing them and torturing them and things like that. But yeah, it uh, goes much into the dark, dark side of Scotland. And it did uh, seem to get particularly dark. And there's rarely a, there's rarely a joyful atmosphere when you're reading this stuff, and the picture that you get of Scotland can warp in ways. But it's also very insightful of what like human beings are capable of a whole. Um, they were people just like us, and somehow they managed to get wound up in this craziness. Something to say about mass hysteria in society, I suppose. Now, if you didn't know, um, King James the Sixth or First. Uh, was actually extremely paranoid and devoted to writing and uh, discovering, trying to find out as much as he could and explain about uh, demons themselves. He was convinced that they were after him. Um, he was convinced that they were trying to destroy his country from the inside out. And if you want to find out about that, then who better than him himself, who wrote this fairly large book that goes all into everything that he's thinking about, everything that he believes and is stating um, as fact, as law, because he is the monarch of um, the whole of Britain. And so what he writes in this book wasn't really up for debate um, in the country at the time and this sort of thing was being believed widely amongst people it wasn't um, we might read that and we'll think well this is this is insane but people back then really took it seriously and if you are a christian or say you're into religious studies this is a really good book because you don't get that insight into Christianity so much um, from just reading religious texts but when you read books like this you see that there's actually been this sort of schism I mean there's not really anything like this in the Bible um, and yet they have created their own metaphysics to explain things that are happening to them or it still lingered from developed being developed from pagan times being carried over until it's turned into until it's been fused with this uh, Christian Puritan fever and transformed into something else but yeah it's a really good book <clears throat> it comes with original illustrations and things like that you even get like some pictures of uh, wanted posters for witches and propaganda that came out in the streets of the cities telling people, you know, that they'll be cursed to damnation if they do any witchcraft curses. I mean, people did do those sorts of things. Uh, people, it wasn't even so controversial as much in the earlier centuries that you would have magicians or people that could practice magic and put curses on people or talk to animals and that sort of thing. So people have done those sorts of things and they believed it but it was only really in this very short period of Scotland where all of that like became um, became so brutal and uh, divisive. Now let's line up a bit. <clears throat> this is Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. 
And this is one of my favorite books of all time. I absolutely love this book. It's a uh, really high literature, but it's not like reading Dostoevsky or Tolstoy or something like that. You could read this to your kids or something. And it's all based in Scotland at the time of the Jacobite uh, Risings and the Highlanders and such. Where a young man, uh, his father dies and he inherits an estate, but he has to go and see his uncle to get it. His uncle is holding um, the promise of a will for uh, the young the young master. And he ends up getting, as the title might imply, kidnapped uh, on, onto a boat. And they plan to sell him to uh, the Americans to work in the cotton fields. And there's loads of little things like that in Kidnapped that make it really historically relevant because when you read this book, especially if you're Scottish, um, I think there's so much stuff in it that's like, wow, did people really do that? Like, I had no idea that the Americans um, slaved Scottish people or that Scottish people even would kidnap other Scots and enslave them, um, well, sell them to the Americans. That that had never, I'd never heard about that anywhere else. But then look it up and yeah, that, that happened. Um, but it goes through a whole adventure around all of Scotland, around the seas, like over the north, around the coast, down all the Hebrides, through the highlands, down into the lowlands, and just a really great storyteller. He manages to say so much with so little words. He manages to paint this whole vivid picture and scene in your head, and you feel like you're really there, and all the characters are, they're really great, they're so, uh, you can sympathize with them so much, and, and feel them, or get the right tone from them, you know, for the villains, they feel a bit dodgy, and weird. I'm really sorry about that, guys. Just a message that I got on Discord on Vibrant. But yeah, it's, it'd probably be an amazing book to read on holiday or something like that. But even just, you know, you want something light and easy to read, but that's still got like so much weight, so much knowledge. And I would say that um, from what I've read and studied upon, like what I've been interested in, uh, Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson is surprisingly historically accurate. He wrote it in the 19th century, I believe, but he managed to do a really good job of giving you an insight into what that place was like in a really fun way. I mean, yes, it's brutal and it has its like scary moments, but um, it's more like adventurous and inspiring, and it's got like a great spirit about it. Really great book, definitely highly recommend that one to everyone. So I got two books here just to wind things up at the end and uh, they're both light, they're both easy to read, accessible but at the same time like the rest uh, very comprehensive and these are like a broad, broad sweeping right so I got a history of Scotland by Neil Oliver, and he is actually a lot like um, Barry Cunliffe in his writing style. He takes you right through uh, all of Scotland, like Scarabray and the Orkney Islands and all of that, uh, right up to the present day. Um, he talks about SNP in the seventies and stuff like that. So it really does go all the way and um 
a friend gave me this book because he thought I might like it, and I did. I was a bit skeptical at first because I've read some other books published by the BBC, like Andrew Marr's History of the World, and I just felt that it was really lacking. Um, and it just, there were so many things that just didn't seem right or wrong or like glossed over. But uh, yeah, Neil Oliver did a, a great job with this, and it's a it's a great book if you just want something easy to read, pick up, and uh, learn more about Scotland and depth. Then yeah, it's a great book. And you do get pictures and stuff in here as well, though it's not as in depth, but great references lead you into many other places if you ever want to find out any more stuff about Scotland this book will have so much stuff in it that will um, touch on in brief that, that you'll probably find more that you could read or want to find out more about and yeah this is the lore of Scotland by Westwood and Kingshill now this is more like a dictionary style and format see how it's all like margins differently and stuff like that see so look this is a great example of what this book's got to offer here's a uh Here's a map, right, of Lothian and Borders, the south of the Lothian and Borders in Scotland. And each one of these is like a key point on the map. Now I'll just read the legend out for you, I'll put it up there so you can see it a little bit. But it says like clan and family legends, curses and divine interventions, death and burial, devils and demons, dragons and sea serpents, fairies and trolls. Ghosts and omens, heroes and villains, witches and witchcraft. So, like, it has a map of all of Scotland where you can see, like, all these different sites. Like, maybe you're interested in finding out more about witches. Well, then you can, like, get this map to see specifically all these different sites where that stuff could have happened. Or if you look at wizards, maybe it'll tell you stuff like, um, uh, Yester Castle. Where like a wizard like allegedly lived it and stayed and built by goblins and things like that. And it's uh it's really it's really in depth. It goes into all sorts of things. And it's it it would be like it's such a great book for like getting inspiration. Maybe you're like writing stories or, or you're a writer or a painter or something like that and you want to get ideas for like creating uh, this real life stuff. <clears throat> These legends and things that happened in Scotland, it makes it turn into this beautiful fantasy land. That's the vibes that you get of Scotland after reading this book, that it's this magical, um, strange almost exotic land and I like it because you know it gives the, it, it puts things back into this really cool perspective where it's yes it's dark yes it has brutal things and all the rest of it but it also has heroes and it also has just this wonder to the whole thing I do think Scotland is a very mystic place a very haunted place a lot of spiritual activity in the place and this history really is worth studying you can get an awful lot from looking into the history of this very relatively small piece of land you now we're just half an island but the amount of history is so rich and immense wealth. 
so that's it for me today guys I hope you enjoyed it I know it's been a long one but yeah got a lot of books there and I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed the video I hope you potentially enjoy picking one of these up and read them and yeah I hope you stay tuned as well because I still got plenty more books back there it might take me a while to go through all of them but I'll be doing my best and making sure to try and get the best ones for you guys so catch you later on peace